So with that disclaimer being said, let's get into it. So um, what is Web3? Uh, so in back in the heyday, you know, like 80s, 90s, we had Web, web 1.0. It was very much, um, it was decentralized to a certain extent because people were trying to figure out what is the internet? What is the World Wide Web? Um, and a lot of content was just, you know, you could, it was put up by companies or people and it was, or uh, like official um, governments and whatnot. And it was like read only. So there wasn't really a content rich internet at the time. And then eventually we gave, moved into web 2.0, which is where we are right now, which is very participatory, meaning it's content rich. You know, you got like social media and blogs and vlogs and all this kind of stuff, people creating tons of content. Uh, but it became very, very centralized. Um, <clears throat> a handful of big conglomerates and corporations essentially uh, control the internet or control the data flowing around the internet. Um, so Web3 is this talked about next evolution from Web2. And the entire concept is, is about going back to the kind of uh, a more decentralized nature uh, where all your data isn't being uh, controlled by uh, specific companies um, to try to get rid of intermediaries and give more uh, data power back to people, let them control uh, how the internet um, is using their data essentially. Um, but there are a lot of aspects of Web3, which we're gonna get into. So one of the aspects of Web3 are dApps. <clears throat> so dApps are basically decentralized apps. And the importance of dApps is like right, right now, for example, if I create a mobile app, I have really only have two places I can submit to, maybe three if you count Microsoft, but uh, you know, you have uh, Google's Play Store, you have the App, Apple App Store, and Google and Apple, um, I, I guess Microsoft too, you know, they have their ecosystem, but it's not as uh, uh, prevalent. They control the ecosystems. Um, you know, they take a certain amount of fees from the app developers. They are like, they control the entire um, experience and act as uh, gatekeepers. Decentralized applications don't um, are great because you don't have to go through the gatekeepers. You can create apps on your own and um, <clears throat> formulate them and, and publish them on various blockchains um, that aren't um, being kept by specific gatekeepers. You can uh, create apps that don't um, control people's data necessarily. Like for example, if if I create a mobile app on the App Store, Apple App Store, I'm essentially giving data over to Apple. And um, and also to the app developers themselves, uh, and you don't really always know how they're using those that data, right? They say one thing, they don't always do it correctly. Uh, decentralized applications are meant to give uh, people who use apps and also app developers a more uh, anonymous way of using people or not using people's data, but um, more like you 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 have the ability to let people know what you want them to let. Want, want to let them know, right? It's not just like, here's a terms and service agreement, click agree and you're giving everything away. You just don't have any you know, legal leeway there. So those are dApps uh, in a nutshell. And then another part, like I mentioned, is that you can probably monetize your own data through Web3, um, which is really important. Uh, like I said, we're in Web 2.0 right now. And um, you know, places like Meta or Google or Microsoft or Amazon, Uber, Lyft, all these companies, basically they ingest all your data they use it in their own way, according to their terms and services agreements. And those are all kind of ambiguous, you know, and hard to decipher. So they may say, oh yeah, your data is private, but you know, you take a company like Meta, for example, who has had a history of, uh, you know, bad data practices, you know, it's like, really, can you take them at their word? I don't know, you know, some companies you can, some you can't. I'm not here to pass judgment on any company, but it's a kind of a wild west landscape in terms of uh, trust, right? So, um, and also like with Web 2.0, you can't monetize your own data. You can't say to uh, any company and say, hey, you're going to collect my data. I want to charge you like a dollar to do that. Um, so with Web 3, there's this kind of floating idea of maybe we can create, uh, you know, collective data bargaining agreements or something like that, basically unionizing your data. It's an interesting idea. It hasn't really been implemented yet, really. Um, so we'll see. It's an interesting concept. NFTs are also a big part of uh, Web3 ecosystem. Um, NFTs are really interesting. I'm an artist myself. I've been in the music industry for like 20 years. Uh, I'm also a writer, also create NFTs myself. So NFTs um, stand for non-fungible tokens. And non-fungible simply means um, you can't, um, can't corrupt the nature of the ownership and the rights of, uh, of the, uh, um, the, the digital rights of any art that's uh, created. Sorry, I'm fumbling a little over my words here. 
Um, so you might have heard like a back, maybe a few years back, a couple of years through three years back or something like that, like Nyan Cat, that GIF uh, was sold for like $580,000 as an NFT, um, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Um, it's been other NFTs sold, like Jack Dorsey's first tweet was like over a million dollars or something like that. So some ridiculous price. Um, the other the one thing to understand about NFTs, if you don't know already, is that um, when I buy an NFT, I'm simply buying the rights behind the art. I'm not necessarily buying the artwork itself. So like, let's say I bought Nyan Cat. Now, if Nyan Cat itself, if I didn't download it for myself, or if it's not published online anywhere, I do have the digital rights, meaning I can control how it's published. I can control uh, if anybody else wants to publish it, they have to probably go through me and pay me some you know, rights to do that. Um, but if the nine cat, the creator of nine cat art failed to actually publish the art anywhere, uh, I wouldn't actually be able to see the art. I just have the rights to it, but I won't have any access unless I reach out to the artist and say, Hey, can you actually give me a copy of this, you know, um, of the actual original art so that I can have it in, in my own uh, possession. So NFTs in a nutshell are basically the rights behind an art. Don't mistake that for the art itself. And, and NFTs can be created for many different things. You have uh, trading cards, you have music, you have in-game, um, you know, uh, economies. And like I mentioned, you have tweets. So you can basically, anything that can be digitized can be turned into an NFT. And it's really exciting for independent artists like myself who um, can kind of circumvent big publishing houses and, you know, sell our art on our own terms. Um, so that's one of the big um, benefits to NFTs for independent artists. Another big aspect of Web3 is AR and VR, basically the metaverse mixed the reality stuff. Um, and you see, you know, I mentioned Meta earlier, they're trying to make this big push into the metaverse. Um, I have my own feelings about Mark Zuckerberg, but I, which I won't get into here. But um, I think the, the general uh, concept is basically to create, you know, virtual worlds uh, based on blockchain, te blockchain technologies that are interoperable, which we'll talk about in a second, that can, so imagine like if uh, Meta created their own metaverse, if uh, another company created another metaverse, maybe you can jump in and out of different uh, worlds. Uh, through um, the interoperable blockchain technologies. Um, we're still a long ways from a true metaverse. Um, in fact, I would say even like the concept of metaverse has been around for a long time in gaming, any like big, you know, open, uh, you know, world role-playing game uh, is essentially like a progenitor of meta metaverses. So they've been around for a while and now it's just about getting us actually there. So uh, another part of uh, the Web3 will be permissionless blockchains. This is more of a technical aspect, meaning that I don't necessarily need to get permission from anybody to publish something on the blockchain. There are private blockchains and there are permissionless blockchains. I say a uh, uh, majority of blockchain is public and so therefore it's permissionless. Anytime you see like a permission blockchain, it's usually like a private enterprise like internal company blockchain that somebody's developing so you don't want the public using it it's just for like internal company use um, but generally i say like 90 percent plus um, of the blockchain now there's all permissionless and that means it's decentralized it's transparent there's a digital ledger um, i'm going to get into all that kind of stuff in a bit uh, generally it's anonymous um, you're just sharing your um, you know wallet addresses you're not really sharing your own personal info and you know the blockchains they run on uh, token currencies, which we'll get to in a little bit too. Um, so also a huge, huge aspect of Web three is going to be really important is AI and machine learning. Um, you know, with blockchain scaling, um, it's going to be really important to have AI and machine learning integrated to help us um, scale even bigger and faster. Uh, right now, it's uh, I'd say it's you know, blockchains, it's been around for like, you know, a little over a decade, but it's still really in its infancy. And to really uh, scale it out, we're going to need the help of AI and machine learning. But there's also other really interesting uses for machine learning in NFTs, for example, like you've probably heard of the bored apes, right? Like all of these apes were uh, created by a machine, machine learning algorithm. They're not actually done by hand. Like the very first one was done by hand, and then it was programmed to create all these different kinds of bored apes, which were then sold for crazy sums of money back in the, uh, when NFTs were just uh, being started. So, uh, you know, machine learning, AI technologies, they're going to be really important to Web3 and scaling. They're also a lot of fun uses in terms of uh, different things like NFTs. Now, interoperability, this is the big one. We don't really get to Web3 unless we have interoperability. Um, and the reason why it's important is essentially, oh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, 
right now there's all sorts of different blockchain protocols. There's like Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, there's Cardano, there's Solana. Uh, there's all these like different um, blockchain protocols that work on their own way, but they don't necessarily talk to each other. So you have to create all these like bridging technologies like um, Polygon, uh, the Matic, uh, which is like a, a layer two Ethereum um, protocol. Um, so for example, um, you know, if I have, uh, there's like a bunch of Ethereum tokens out there, um, instead of trading directly and paying large Ethereum fees, you get these bridge technologies like uh, Matic that act as a secondary layer built on Ethereum protocols that uh, make trading tokens, Ethereum tokens, base tokens, a lot cheaper. It's like a flat fee usually, um, but if they don't necessarily uh, talk to non-Ethereum tokens. So you have to have different um, bridge technology like exchanges, for example, you know, like Coinbase or whatnot, you know, they create these um, kind of bridges for different um, coins and tokens to be interchanged and uh, traded amongst each other. So interoperability is gonna be huge for Web3. Currently we are not there yet. So if you hear people say Web3 is here, it's not here yet until we get interoperability. That is the, the fundamental hugest thing that will make Web3 exist. Um, so, I don't know how many years out we are, but there, there are a lot of uh, smart people working on interoperability uh, issues. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm incredibly optimistic we'll get there pretty fast. So that's Web3 in a nutshell. Um, now we're gonna talk about, you know, all the different layers of like, what's decentralization? What's the distributed ledger? What's cryptocurrencies? Basically what's all the fuss, right? Um, you may have seen this meme, just hodl it, uh, you know, over the pandemic. Um, it's just somebody, when, when cryptocurrencies were starting to gain steam in terms of value, somebody tweeted, just hodl it when they meant just hold it. It was a mis, uh, you know, mistype. And it just basically took on you know, life of its own on the internet as all things do on the internet. So if you hear people saying just hodl it, it just means just hold, hold on to your cryptocurrencies. Um, and it's usually for people who are just tracking the investment side of things. Um, so decentralized cryptographic currency, um, you know, what does all that mean, right? What does all that mean? Um, so I'm going to help demystify some of this stuff. The pillars of crypto in uh, basically decentralization is that there's no central authority, meaning there's no uh, central uh, bank or government that can control the entire ecosystem. Um, so imagine, for example, like, you know, I have like a banking transaction uh, through, let's say, Bank of America or whatever, Wells Fargo, you know, whatever the bank is. And I basically have to trust this bank to do everything it says it's going to do. I, I have to trust that every single employee there is ethical, not corrupt, um, not doing any shady things on the side. Um, or I have to trust like any single government to be trustworthy with their fiat currency and not be doing any shady, shady business. Um, now, we all know that there are a lot of corrupt governments, corrupt governments out there. And we also know that shady stuff does happen at banks. So without a central authority um, at cryptocurrency, you don't have these like conglomerates or one government that can control an entire ecosystem, um, which can impact you at a lot of different levels. For example, like if an economy is going sideways, you may see banks freeze accounts. And now all of a sudden you don't have access to any of your money. Um, they do that for various reasons, which I'm not gonna get into, but for um, cryptocurrencies, because there's no central authority, you always have access to your um, coins or tokens. Nobody can just like freeze your accounts. Now, that being said, um, if you use exchanges like Coinbase or Gemini, or um, you probably heard about FTX recently, which basically just blew up, um, they can freeze trading on accounts, but it doesn't mean that you're, you don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have access to your, your coins and tokens outside of the exchanges. Uh, you can still create transactions like peer-to-peer -peer, um, outside of exchanges. You just need exchanges to convert all those um, coins and tokens to actual dollars. And whatnot. So uh, secure global access. Um, so blockchains are incredibly secure. They're based on uh, cryptography. And um, you know, you may hear once in a while like such and such got hacked. It's usually not the blockchain technology itself that got hacked. It's usually like an exchange that had bad security layers, or um, you know, somebody working at a company shared some kind of security protocol. Uh, you know, but it's not usually the technology itself that gets hacked. It's usually like all these different. Uh, corporate layers, um, corporate layer technology that, that gets hacked through negligence or whatnot. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't large ramifications to hacks. There are, 
Um, but the technology itself is very sound and secure and the security layers are getting better and better as we go. People are learning a lot from all these previous hacks. And in fact, um, it's just a cycle that we all have to go through. Like, you know, if you think about the internet in the heydays, in the, um, pre, uh, in the nation days, uh, there was a lot of hacks going on there too, um, and still are really in the current internet ecosystem. So um, blockchain technologies are meant to actually mitigate a lot of this. And hopefully we'll see less and less issues going forward as we move into Web3 eventually. Uh, full transparency is a, is a massive part of a pillar of uh, cryptocurrency, and that is the distributed ledger. So what is the distributed ledger? Essentially, getting back to like not having a single authority. So imagine, um, you know, instead of all your transactions residing on like a, a bank's internal servers where you have no insight, no transparency, there's no accountability really at a public level, uh, blockchains, public blockchains are distributed amongst thousands upon thousands of computers globally. Um, that the ledger is copied in its entirety across each computer and it exists in its entirety. So not one single entity or person can control the entire ledger. It's always transparent and accountable and it's shared amongst everybody who's taken part in this ecosystem. So that's called the distributed ledger, which makes it fundamentally decentralized. Um, there's a ton of benefits to this, um, which I've already talked about in terms of you know dealing with potentially corrupt governments or corrupt uh, banking systems. Um, but, you know, just being able to see where a transaction originated from, the entire history of a transaction, really. So, like, it's applicable to things like supply chains. So, let's say um, I have a chair. Before that chair, a wooden chair, before that wooden chair was made, it was, uh, you know, manufactured. It was created by somebody. It, like, all those, uh, the wood came from a tree, and then the tree was, you know, had to go through, uh, lumber distribution, and whatnot. Like you could, on a blockchain, you could be able to see that entire supply chain and uh, how that uh, came to be to become this chair. Um, and it, that can really help in uh, probably tamping down on like corruption in supply chains, uh, a lot of transparency there. So there's a lot of possibilities with uh, decentralization. Um, the other part uh, that I'm going to get into right now is the cryptographic part of blockchain technologies. Um, you know, blockchain is probably, the technology is probably a little bit hard to understand for a lot of people. Like, how does it actually work, right? So the first um, block was, blockchain was created by this uh, person or entity called Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, people think they find out who this person is or persons are, um, but it really it still kind of remains a mystery of who the inventor of the blockchain was. Um, they just go by this moniker Satoshi Nakamoto. If you want to go down that rabbit hole, feel free. I stay away from it because it'll just basically take up all your life. But essentially, how does a blockchain work? It's basically a chain of um, blocks of data chained together, and it's all encrypted data. Um, it's pretty much self-explanatory in, in this name, the blockchain. Um, but how it works is I'm going to give you a very, very elementary description. This is uh, not how it technically works, so I'm not going to get into um, you know the how things are um, encrypted and whatnot. But let's say I want to uh, create my own first my own blockchain. I have to create my first block of data. So um, that block of data uh, has a what is called a hash, which is like a random string of numbers of indeterminate size. So it could be sixteen numbers, could be thirty two, could be sixty four, could be one hundred twenty eight. Who knows? Um, and then it's um, encrypted into uh, a, a different uh, set of numbers that needs to be decrypted to, in order to verify it. And in, then in order to um, add additional blocks of data, you go through that kind of the same process. There's a hash on the block, it gets encrypted, and then these verifiers have to decrypt it and verify the hash behind the block. Um, but to give you a really, really simplistic example, let's say block number one has the number one. It wouldn't, it would never do that because that's ridiculous. But um, that one, that number one would get encrypted into whatever other number, some verifier would have to um, decrypt the encrypted layer and verify, oh, this block is actually number one. Uh, so you add that to the blockchain, it's block number one. Now let's say uh, there's another transaction that happens um, and you need to add block number two. So maybe block number two becomes one, two. Again, it's not going to follow sequential numbers like this, but uh, just for this example, it will. So that number gets encrypted, then a verifier and uh, needs to decrypt it, or a bunch of verifiers actually are usually competing to decrypt this. Um, then they'd look at the hash and go, is it one, two? Oh, it is, great. Um, is there consensus on that? Great, everybody agrees, it's one, two, let's add it to the block. So now you have one, one, two, 
and so on and so forth. You just keep adding blocks and you keep adding numbers to the blockchain, which need to be encrypted, decrypted, verified, all that kind of stuff. So the blockchain essentially works like that. Um, I'm not going to get into, like I said, the full technical details of how it, it really, really works, but at a very, very surface level, that, that's how it is. Um, so right now, uh, you know, blockchains like take Bitcoin or Ethereum, for example, it's, it's huge. They're large as hell. Um, and they take a lot of energy to um, go through and, and decrypt and verify. So, you know, what does the future hodl? Um, well, you have to start thinking about different blockchains, like which is better. Um, there are ramifications to different kind of blockchain protocols. Uh, take uh, Bitcoin versus Ethereum, the two, um, the top two, right? Um, at an energy level, or actually, before I get to the energy part of it, um, Bitcoin works off of a protocol called proof of work. Uh, Ethereum just move over to something called proof of stake. Um, proof of work, the way that it works is like, as mentioned, when you need to verify, you know, blocks that are being added to the blockchain, it's usually all these single computers around the world using insane amounts of energy to uh, run mathematical um, equation to, to do the decryptions and the verifications of each data block. And they're competing each, against each other. So the proof of work is really like if one single computer does it faster than anybody else, they submit the work. The other computers actually need to verify that work. Once it's verified, that person or that computer that, um, that you know did the work gets a reward, usually Bitcoin uh, in, this, in this case. And <clears throat> then the block of data is added to the blockchain. Proof of stake works a little bit different. Um, it's usually off of a, um, a staking uh, consensus. So for example, let's say instead of one single computer competing against all the other single computers around the world, uh, you have a, a staker <coughs> who creates a, a pool. And so uh, to contribute to a pool, let's say um, Tom or Diane or whoever creates, uh, wants to be, become a staker, um, she'll say, hey, contribute to my pool. I've put in let's say my uh, X amount of um, you know, coins or tokens into this pool, you put in your, your stake, um, your, whatever you own, let's say it's Ethereum in this, in this case. Uh, so I put in my Ethereum and everybody else does. So like that pool starts competing against other pools. It's not just single computers competing against single computers. So I don't need to necessarily contribute my computing, computing power uh, to, to the uh, staking pool. I'm just contributing my coins, contributing my coins in order to have a larger pool to compete uh, with other pools. And then the validator who runs the pool, <clears throat> they're the ones competing, doing the work, their computer's doing the work and doing the actual uh, competing to, to run the proof. Um, the benefit of this is that there's a massive difference in energy consumption between proof of work and proof of stake. So you can see here, the yellow line here is over the last you know five, five years or so, how much energy, um, Bitcoin has consumed in terms of proof of work. You can see that Ethereum, before it became proof of stake, Ethereum used to actually be on proof of work um, until last year. Before that, it was probably about two and a half times less, two and a third times less than Bitcoin in terms of energy use. But since it's moved over to proof of stake, uh, that energy use has plummeted. Um, and you can see it's almost like 14 times less than Bitcoin power consumption. Um, so proof of stake has massive ramifications in terms of energy usage. Uh, and there's a lot of um, um, there's a lot of push right now to hold Bitcoin accountable for its energy consumption. But Bitcoin still is the primary blockchain that people trust and are doing trades and whatnot on top of. Um, so we have a long ways to go in terms of bringing down the energy costs because there are a lot of blockchains out there, not just Bitcoin and Ethereum, a lot of different protocols. Um, you might even hear things of like proof of time or proof of space. There's all just people working on different proofs to see, to bring down the energy consumption. Uh, proof, but proof of stake right now is um, probably the second, <clears throat> second trusted way of doing things. So which is better? I think if you're looking at energy, I think it's clear that proof of stake is better. Um, you know, for me, that, that's like a big primary concern in terms of, you know, climate and global warming and whatnot. So for me, proof of stake is better, but there's, there's people argue the other way around too. Um, another thing that Ethereum has right now is smart contracts. Bitcoin doesn't have smart contracts. So um, what are smart contracts all about? Let's talk about uh, traditional contracts. So you got, you know, two parties or maybe various parties. They, 
write up a contract and then you have a third party, maybe like lawyers or like in terms of real estate, you have um, escrow officers who um, are trusted to help you execute upon the contract and make sure all parties do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, usually those are, you know, done pretty well. Usually you can trust your lawyers or the escrow officers and whatnot, or the banking media, uh, mediaries, intermediaries. Um, <clears throat> and usually things get executed as per the terms of the contract. But sometimes things get misinterpreted, or sometimes you get, um, you know, nefarious people who are conducting the um, conducting themselves as intermediaries for the contracts. So things can go wrong. Now, a smart contract is gets rid of the third party inter intermediaries, and basically, it's hard coded contracts on the blockchain, so it's transparent. You can see what's in the contract. You can see how it's going to be executed, and essentially, a program executes on the contract. And, you know, un unless somebody wrote a program that is nefarious, that is meant to not, you know, conduct itself correctly, you can, you, you know, like 99% of the time, trust that this program is going to run the contract correctly as long as each party does what they say. So for example, in a, you know, real estate contract, uh, the buyer puts up the money, the contract basically is, goes, oh, okay, all the, all the money's there, the seller has done all the reports, uh, the program goes, oh, yeah, the seller has done all the reports correctly. They're all signed off and signed. Um, you know, we can execute on this transaction and do the exchange. The buyer gets to the house, seller gets the money. Yay. And we go on our ways. Um, now, I, I was in the real estate industry for 10 years. I was an escrow officer and I've seen things go wrong um, when you have people, um, you know, errors do occur. Not, not, not through any like, you know, nefarious reasons, just mistakes happen. Um, you know, if it's if a contract is programmed, tip, you would think theoretically is that there shouldn't be those kind of huge, you know, uh, percentage of human mistakes that can happen. So smart contracts um, are really, really awesome. Um, to give you uh, kind of a real world, bit of a silly uh, example of how a smart contract might work. Um, take a vending machine, for example. Um, I'm a huge Lego enthusiast. Uh, and I was really surprised when I was at the airport and I saw a Lego vending machine. That blew my mind a little bit, but so I'm just showing a Lego vending machine. But imagine if you had a vending machine that said, "If you give me one dollar, I will give you ten thousand dollars." Now, if somebody off the street told you that, you know, would you give them a dollar? You know, even if you wrote up a contract, would you trust this person necessarily to give you ten thousand dollars? That's kind of an extreme, ridiculous scenario, but you know, ridiculous scenarios do happen in the real world, and you have to have a very, very strong layer of trust in order for that transaction, to, for you to believe that transaction will actually occur. So if I'm gonna give this vending machine a dollar, I need to have a lot of trust that it won't break down, eat my dollar up, or just not do what it's gonna say it's gonna do. Now with smart contracts, uh, the theory here is that that vending machine is 100% trustworthy. It is gonna do what it's gonna say, even, it's, even though this agreement is completely absurd. So if I give it a dollar, it's going to give me $10,000. And I can trust that it's going to do that because you just got a coded layer, a coded contract and a program's gonna run on it. And that's it, it's not corruptible. So uh, that's a bit of a, rid a ridiculous example, but it gives you an idea of the difference between a smart contract and a typical contract, which is basically the trust layer is pretty exponential and you should theoretically be able to trust smart contracts very much. So uh, one kind of another silly thing that I hear bandied around, you might've seen this online, is like if I buy something with the cryptocurrencies and you know those valuations are going up and down, does all of a sudden the thing I bought follow the value of the crypto that I bought it with? Um, no, it doesn't. So just to nip that part in the bud and help you understand, if I bought a t-shirt, if, if I have a t-shirt for that's worth $10, like a target or whatever, and I sold it to you for back in the day when Bitcoin was worth $10. And now Bitcoin is worth, I think last time I checked, it was like around $17,000. Is my shirt, assuming I didn't wear it, it's still brand new, does that shirt that you bought from me, is that shirt now worth $17,000? No, of course not. It's probably worth about $10, maybe $12 with inflation. It's really based on a market value. Um, it has nothing to do with how much the crypto is actually um, you know, valued at. Uh, same thing. If I bought, if I sold you a shirt for one Bitcoin that was worth ten dollars at a time, and let's say Bitcoin plummeted down to one dollar, is your T-shirt all of a sudden worth one dollar? No, it's still probably ten dollars as long as you didn't use it and it's brand new. Um, so, 
if you have people online saying silly things like I bought something, uh, you know, or somebody sold me something for one Bitcoin, now this something's worth $17,000 or whatever, just don't believe that. It's it's super silly. Um, now, we're going to get into cryptocurrencies and trading and investing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I iterate from the beginning that I'm not going to give any investment advice. So I'm just going to know that going forward. Now, what, what if you don't have thousands and thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to get to buy Bitcoin? Or I think Ethereum is worth like $1,300 uh, a coin right now. What if you don't have that kind of money? Well, guess what? Fractions are your friend. You can actually buy cryptocurrency in fractional amounts. I could buy 0.0001% of a Bitcoin if I wanted to. So like I could put up like 100 bucks and own Bitcoin. I don't need to have $17,000 or even when it was worth like $60,000 or whatever. Um, so you even see right now, like in the uh, regular stock market, some exchanges like Robin, Robinhood or whatnot, they're, they're trying to sell st uh, stocks at a fraction. Um, so it's a unique um, investment strategy and you don't need to be rich to get into this. Um, now, in order to trade or invest in crypto, you do need to have a crypto wallet. Uh, there's different types of wallets. There's um, custodial versus non-custodial. A custodial wallet is something that is held by an exchange. For example, let's go use Coinbase as an example. If I um, uh, deposit you know, US dollars into Coinbase with the intent of buying Bitcoin, for example, uh, when I do that exchange and I, and I own the Bitcoin, I'm holding it within a custodial wallet with Coinbase. They're actually controlling my wallet. Um, in a sense, it's a little bit centralized because now you're trusting the exchange to keep access to your wallet open at all times. Um, so it's custodial. Now, non-custodial wallet is anything like a uh, um, uh, wallet that resides on an app on your phone or like a cold wallet, which is like a hardware uh, wallet based on like a USB stick or something like that. So we're gonna talk about the different types of non-custodial wallets. Um, Non-custodial also means that you have control over your wallet. You're basically moving your coins off of an exchange wallet, bring it into your own custody. Um, so the custodial, non-custodial part simply means it's non-custodial by a centralized organization and it's in your, your uh, power. So there are hot wallets, which are basically apps on your phones. Um, hot wallets are great because you can kind of trade on the fly. You just pop open the app, do your thing. And it's always connected to the inter internet um, and you have uh, really high accessibility to your funds. Now they are uh, vulnerable to phishing and hacking. Typically the security vulnerabilities is if you accidentally share your wallet address with a bad actor and then they use that wallet address to conduct transactions uh, without you knowing. So, or you give away your secret keys to your wallet, which you should really never ever 100% ever do, no matter who is asking it. No exchange is ever going to ask you for your secret key or recovery phrase. No person you're doing a transaction should ever ask you for it either. It's essentially like giving away your password to any login uh, you know, site on the internet or whatnot. Just don't do it, okay? Um, cold wallets are like basically another secure layer. So instead of um, just using your uh, app on your phone, uh, you can use a device like a Ledger USB stick, uh, something which I own, and you can basically uh, dump all your crypto onto a cold wallet, or you use a cold wallet to uh, do a, a, another secure verification layer before you can transmit anything on a hot wallet. Um, so cold wallets are incredibly secure. You can't hack them because their physical device is not connected to the internet. They just sit in a drawer somewhere or a safe. Hopefully you're keeping them in a safe somewhere uh, until you need them. Now the downsides of it is that they're not connected to the internet you do have to go through a few more steps in order to conduct transactions. Um, so, you know, if a currency is fluctuating rapidly on any given day and you're trying to lock in a price, you may not be able to do so, you know, as fast as you wanted to, but it's usually not that bad. Um, but the trade-off is super secure. Um, and it's, again, it's in your control. It's not custodial. Um, so my suggestion here in terms of hot wallet versus cold wallet is if you're uh, dabbling into crypto for the first time, you're not spending a lot of money. It's okay, use a hot wallet, that's fine. If you decide you want to get into it further and own more cryptocurrency, like you know, like a lot, a lot, I highly recommend using cold wallets for the secure um, factors. 
So uh, the other thing to consider when you're dealing with wallets is that not every wallet um, supports every single coin. It's getting better, but back in the heyday, like different wallets supported specific coins and whatnot. Um, but you're seeing like exchanges and different wallets uh, supporting more and more coins. So it's becoming less and less of an issue. Um, same thing with cold wallets. Back in the day, they supported very specific coins like Ledger is one company, Trezor is another company, and they supported different coins. So you had to make a big choice between which device you were going to own. Um, but now they're starting to bring on more blockchain protocols and support different, uh, more, more and more coins. So I think in the future, you're going to see less of this uh, as a problem. But it is a consideration when you want to use a wallet. So um, usually for beginners, usually dabbling like Bitcoin or Ethereum or any like major coins, most wallets support all the major coins. So there's, it shouldn't be an issue for you. But if you want to start going to more obscure coins, then yeah, you got to look into your wallet and see if it uh, supports it. So I mentioned your wallet keys uh, or your recovery phrase earlier. Do not ever, I'm gonna say this again, do not ever 1000% ever give it away. Because once you give it away, you will lose your wallet forever. There is no way to recover a wallet. Once you give somebody your secret key, they open up your wallet, they take everything out of there. There's no way to recover that, okay? So it's not like um, an internet website where if, my password gets hacked, I can actually just reset the password and still have access to my internet account. It doesn't work like that. You lose it, you lose it for good. Okay, so just do not ever do it. Um, and when I say a secret recovery phrase, you might see when you uh, get a wallet for the first time, it'll probably ask you to memorize or jot down like a 12 word uh, recovery phrase. Um, there are different ways to keep that recovery phrase face, uh, safe. Uh, I recommend getting these um, hardware uh, 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 depositories where you basically just keep a record of your recovery phrase on a uh, physical thing that is um, safe from like if, if your place goes up and smokes in a fire, you still can get your recovery phrase off of this device. Um, so like if you write it on a piece of paper, keep it in safe, but then like your place goes up in flames and that paper burns, guess what? You just lost your recovery phrase and you lost complete access to your wallet. So uh, use some kind of a hardware recovery uh, phrase um, keeper. Um, I forget the name of the one I use, but I'll, I can share that in the chat once I think about it. So uh, your secret recovery phrase, I'm going to iterate one last time, 1,000%, keep it safe, do not ever share it. And um, yeah, that's it. So should you or shouldn't you get into crypto? Um, I leave that up to you. You know, Based on all this information that I've given you and armed you with, you should be able to do your own research Think about whether or not it's right for you to participate in the ecosystem. Maybe you don't want to trade on cryptocurrencies. You just want to create NFTs. Sure, do that. But you're still going to have to understand how to do that. You still need to own cryptocurrency to do that, to mint an NFT. Um, so anything that uh, any transaction you want to do on, on the blockchain is going to require you to own some amount of cryptocurrency. So should you or shouldn't you? Um, look, I just encourage you to look into it. Um, I do. You don't have to follow me. Uh, and do your own research on it. Um, but just make sure that, uh, you know, you're not just following what everybody, all the hype is, you know, really, really think about, you know, whether or not you want to participate. I personally think from a technology standpoint, it is the future of the internet in terms of Web3. I think we will get there eventually, um, probably sooner than later. Uh, so it's really exciting. So, you know, if we are talking about a Web3 ecosystem in the future, it's going to be real important for you to learn about how to participate in it. So, um, but right now, it's a should you or shouldn't you. I think in the future, uh, it might be a, you have to. So um, just take that into consideration going forward. And uh, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. And um, I think we're going to go into the many, many questions I see popping up here. I, I think we have yeah a few questions in the chat here. Um, I could go in order. Um, actually, before you do that, I do see Donica's hand is up. So let's do that first. Oh, okay. Um, Donica, you want to type I, your question? Yes, yeah. yes. No, I just got unmuted. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. I appreciate the talk. I I learned the basics, so to speak. Um, I'm curious about one thing. So you mentioned... So there's a couple of, I guess, things that I'm trying to differentiate in my head. So one is the future of the internet, which, you know, uh, we kind of have an idea where it's headed. Mm -hmm. 
And then, but in terms of the Bitcoin as an investment, I guess that's my biggest kind of, because you mentioned like if you bought the t-shirt for $10 and someone tells you, oh, no, it's in value this much. Well, it's not really like, so then what is it like, what, what would it be for me? What kind of usage will I have? other than participating in this new web that we're going into, like, um, I mean, is it worth investing, like buying a Bitcoin if if the value of the, you know, it's not considered the same as any regular, quote unquote, regular investment, you know, like stocks and bonds and with real estate, of course, it's different because it's, you know, um, so yeah, that's what I guess I'm trying to f- differentiate. Yeah, I, I hear a couple questions within your, your question. So I think the easy one I'm going to answer first is, is it worth it to invest? This is not an answer I can give you. This is something that you need to determine for yourself, whether or not you should participate in. And we're just talking about Bitcoin. We're not talking about all the other coins. Okay, Bitcoin itself is fundamentally Right now, it's very speculative. There isn't a lot of real world usage for it. So whether or not you determine this is something you want to take part in, that's up to you. It's highly volatile currency. Um, you know, you can see it has swung from like, you know, zero up to 60,000 at some point. Now it's like at 17,000 and it goes up and down very, very quickly. Um, so it's up to you if you can uh, deal with the heartburn of uh, investing in something like Bitcoin. Um, now, the utility utility of, of coins, um, you know, right now, like I said, Bitcoin doesn't really have a lot of utility. There's a lot of energy cost to just you know, doing a transaction with it. Like, you know, I probably wouldn't buy something um, like as silly as a T-shirt for with Bitcoin. I may buy a house with Bitcoin, you know, because you know, you're talking about like large value exchanges. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would probably buy a T-shirt with like a different coin, you know, like an Ethereum-based coin, like or even something like Cardano, which is like another protocol. I may I may buy something, you know, with different coins that are, are at lower value that are a little bit more stable in terms of their valuation. In in fact, there are coins out there that are actually tied to the U.S. dollar, mm-hmm. so they basically follow the value of the U.S. dollar. And there's a lot of potential utility there for exchanging of actual real goods down the line. Um, but right now, the reason why we don't see a lot of exchange of real goods is because of the energy costs involved. Um, but there are people solving that right now. And you are seeing companies like uh, PayPal or, or I think even Amazon is accepting cryptocurrency at some level. I could be wrong about that. But um, there are companies who are accepting cryptocurrencies in exchange for goods or services. Um, so we're starting to see a fundamental change and shift in that. But for Bitcoin itself, just talking about Bitcoin, it really doesn't have much transactional utility right now, unless it's like a huge transaction. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Ramon, how do you want to do this? You want to uh, curate the questions or should we just go through this one by one? Um, yes, I could begin with the first question I saw pop up in the chat, and this is asked by Wendy. Um, so it's kind of a comment question. Um, so that sounds like the central government has been replaced uh, by platforms like Coinbase, et cetera. Oh, no, 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 yeah, that it has not been replaced. Uh, it's an alternative. Um, you know, nobody has all of a sudden miraculously supplanted any central government or central, bank, central banking agency. In fact, I think, at least for me, this is just my opinion, is that we're going to see them work in partnership into the given future. Maybe central banks move on to blockchain. Maybe central governments move on to blockchain. Maybe they don't. You know, in fact, we see a lot of tension and friction there right now because, you know, uh, blockchain technology is challenging the status quo of how things can be done. So, um, you know, I think in the near future, we're going to start seeing more partnerships develop. Uh, I don't think you know, blockchain technology is going to go away, but it hasn't supplanted any centralized, you know, finance system yet. And um, kind of goes into what Sue asks. She's, um, she still would like to know why we need cryptocurrency when we have a perfectly good monetary system. Um, I think it's debatable whether or not we have a good uh, monetary system. Um, I'm not going to get into the philosophical issues of all that right now, but I want to give you an example of how to imagine um, how a decentralized platform can help somebody. 
Now in the U.S., it's probably like an afterthought. You know, there's a lot of trust in institutions and whatnot. But let's say you're in a corrupt region of the world where you cannot trust the government to hold your um, money correctly or any central financial banking system. You can't just can't trust them. There are many regions of the world that are like this. Now in a decentralized system, if I can um, have access to currency on my own terms and it is um, hard coded in the ledger, you cannot forge the ledger. You don't have any bad actors that can go in there and basically uh, forge transactional history. It's all there. Um, so when I'm <clears throat> trading currency amongst my peers, it's completely trustworthy. I don't have to deal with whether or not I'm, I'm you know, this corrupt system uh, will magically make my money disappear all of a sudden. Um, and then I can, you know, maybe exchange the cryptocurrency that I use with a more trusted centralized finance system. So let's say I'm in, I don't know, somewhere in South Africa or, or South America or something like that, some, some weird region. Um, there are even corrupt regions in the U.S., let's, let's admit it. Um, so wherever there's a corrupt um, system, you know, let's say I'm trading cryptocurrency amongst my peers, but then I can go to a trusted exchange like, uh, you know, Coinbase or Gemini or something and go, hey, I want to exchange all this for U.S. dollars. Um, and then, uh, but you still need to put those U.S. dollars into a bank that you trust. So whether or not you have access to a U.S. bank or a safer bank, that's a whole nother layer. Um, another really good reason for decentralized uh, currency is that, let's say, in poverty-stricken regions where it's really, really hard for people to get access to banks. Uh, let's say I've, you know, I'm living on the streets. I don't have ID. How could I ever open a bank account? How could I ever participate in a financial system? it's almost impossible because of all these bureaucratic layers I have to jump through. Um, and that has nothing to do with corruption, it's just red tape. Um, now with cryptocurrency, I can have immediate access uh, to a financial system that I can participate in um, in a decentralized manner that isn't controlled by all this red tape. Um, so there are a lot of benefits in decentralization and it can benefit a lot of people who have been underprivileged or disenfranchised. Okay, and we have another question. I think it's Stevie or Stevie. Um, so was FTX a custodial account? Uh, did holders lose their money? Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, it, actually, there's nothing to laugh about. Um, it's really, really sad what happened. Um, but yes, a lot of people lost a lot of money. And it's, okay. it's probably unrecoverable. Okay, so then we have a few comments or clarifications. But then um, Seth asks, what is the difference between short-term and long-term crypto trading? Um, I, I guess that's the difference between, uh, you know, like a day trader and a long-term investor on the stock market. You know, the short term is you're dealing with uh, uh, quick rapid trades, uh, dealing with a lot of volatility with the market. Long-term is just, you know, you buy something, you hold on to it maybe for a few years and then hopefully it goes up um, and then you sell it. And, uh, Tom has an interesting comment, especially about this FTX um, fraud and maybe it's its effects on creating fear among people that I think is uh, we've heard a lot of. Uh, he says, widespread adoption of Web, web 3.0, especially crypto, seems far off of, or never given recent FTX financial fraud. Um, okay, we're, we're getting into the realm of opinion here. Uh, which I don't mind talking about. Um, but, but the first thing uh, to clarify is that Web3, Web3.0 are actually very, very different things. You're going to see people mix those terms up uh, quite often. Uh, Web3.0 is usually like the technological protocols that people are talking about. Web3 is more of like the ecosystem that we're talking about. So I was talking about Web3, not Web3.0. So there's a distinction there. Um, adoption and fear. Look, this is, like I said, it's still a very, very new ecosystem, uh, even though it's been around a little over a decade. You know, imagine the modern banking system or the modern, um, you know, stock exchange. It went through the same trials and tribulations in the early days. Don't think what we have right now just manifested perfectly, you know, and even still in many aspects, it's not perfect. There are still corruption problems and whatnot. Um, so what we're seeing right now, um, yeah, it's these things cause fear, but they also cause people to make really rapid improvements. And that's, I think, the beauty of uh, modern technology is that we can course correct very, very fast. It's not like back in the heyday where a course correction is like moving the Titanic and you're still trying to steer clear a bunch of icebergs. Um, but it does, I think, 
Yes, the negative part of this is that we were trusting a lot of unethical entrepreneurs who started exchanges and did nefarious things and did things that were not transparent and you know just basically lost people a lot of money. The positive side of this is that it definitely drives home the, the point of using non-custodial wallets, which we have been talking about for a decade now. You know, we've been talking about this, you know, from the beginning, do not use custodial wallets once those exchanges came into play. Um, it doesn't mean that you should never trust an exchange. There are exchanges out there that are trustworthy. You know, Coinbase is pretty trustworthy. Gemini is pretty trustworthy. Um, there's Binance. There's some trust issues there with Binance, but for the most part, it's pretty solid. Um, there are other exchanges out there. And as, uh, you know, more exchanges come into play as and as more government regulation comes into play, I think we're going to see more stability in the exchange um, ecosystem. So it's really unfortunate what happened with FTX. And yes, it's, it's kind of a step back um, anyways, but um, the ecosystem is still moving forward. Um, you know, development on blockchain and interest in blockchain didn't just stop. It's still there. So uh, it's up to you on how you want to react to things like that. Okay. Um, next question we have is Edith asks, what's your take on Solana? Thank you. Uh, my take on Solana um, is just another blockchain protocol. Um, it seems pretty secure. I personally don't know a whole lot about Solana. So, you know, forgive me because there are so many blockchain protocols out there at this point. Um, I don't know about every single one of them. Um, but from what I hear, it's pretty stable. Um, or it, it might, or no, actually, let me, let me correct that. I have heard that there are maybe some stability issues compared to like Ethereum or uh, Bitcoin, but um, I haven't heard any major problems with it. Uh, so yeah, that's my take. You know, sorry, I can't give you more information on Solana. Yeah, and then this seems like it's a comment. Uh, kind of like advice maybe, I don't know. Um, so it's pretty long. Uh, Z says, big companies like Meta, Amazon, Tesla uh, may have more swings down to up 70% too, but fluctuations to me are okay as long as it's eventually has a good chance of going up. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are not the same thing. Number one reason most cryptos have a CEO or CEO like authority and are pre-mined initially. Bitcoin wasn't, I recommend folks to differentiate between them and not consider everything that has the name crypto, uh, same as Bitcoin, at least in my view. Uh, I guess I'm trying to understand if that comment is meant to be investment advice. Um, I take all investment advice with a grain of salt. Everybody should formulate their own opinions based on as much good information as they can. I think, you know, the, the comment here, I'm looking at it again, um, most crypto have a CEO or CEO like authority and pre mined initially. Bitcoin wasn't. Um, sure, I guess that's correct. Um, I guess everybody has a name crypto, same as Bitcoin. I guess I'm trying to understand this sentence. Uh, do not consider everything that has a name crypto the same as Bitcoin. Could Z Wu, could you expand a little bit on what you're thinking is there? Are you just saying like, you know, like when people say like quantum this, quantum that, not everything is like quantum. Is that basically what you're saying? Or maybe Zoo's not here. Um, I, I'm just going to take that comment as that. So yeah, there's people who are like banding around the word crypto. Be careful. You know, not everything is a solid or fundamental cryptocurrency or based on, uh, you know, blockchain technology. There are different layers. And there are different protocols being created that aren't, nece aren't necessarily blockchain technologies themselves, but that they utilize blockchain technologies. Um, they're just acting as a different layer on top of it. Um, th those are still crypto in the sense of, you know, they're they're part of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. But yeah, there are definitely people out there who are just using the word crypto, just like people use the word quantum, you know, without really understanding what it means. Okay, again, we have some recommendations in the chat. Um, but let me go to the next question. What causes the volatility of crypto? Asked uh, by Joan. It's Sorry. simple economics, supply and demand. Um, that's the nut of it. Yeah. Just like the stock market, essentially. I mean, I mean, it, definitely more complexity to it. Um, but at the very fundamental layer of it, it's just supply and demand. Okay. And Jing asks, under what 
kind of situation where you mistakenly give away the key? Oh, like uh, there's all sorts of phishing uh, scams out there. Let's say, um, let's say uh, a company, actually I saw this recently in my email, uh, a random email got through my spam filter and said, hey, we're dropping rare NFTs um, and you were chosen to take part in this NFT drop. Give us your wallet address and we'll uh, do that. So the wallet address itself, it's still pretty innocuous. You know, I may go, oh, this is cool. I'm going to give him a wallet address. But part of this phishing a scam is then they go, oh, but we need your recovery key to fully do the transactions. Like, okay, I'm not going to give you my recovery phrase. Um, that This is purely a scam. And I think a lot of ways to actually um, uh, recognize scams also is like if you see an email from a company that doesn't actually do NFTs, like the email I saw came from some cooking website and i was like what is this um so people are getting scammed out of their uh, wallet holdings um through phishing scams like this so just be careful um, when you get people um reaching out to you randomly saying hey give us your wallet address we got some cool stuff or we want, or we want to give you some cryptocurrency because you were chosen to do this um do some digging you know see where the source came from just like any other email these days um, you got to look at you know where it came from and then if they ever ask for your passphrase or you know recovery phrase don't give it away um and this is not to say that there aren't legitimate uh transactions that happen like you know sometimes um there are companies that do give away free currency you know just to onboard people into their ecosystem so there are legitimate you know reasons to participate in that um, but just be careful those people who are doing legitimately will never ask you for your recovery phrase ever and um, Edith seems to have a comment here. I don't know if I missed the first part of the question here, but it's something about uh, not being the most environmentally friendly. I think um, we've heard how much, I think generally the public has heard that it affects the environment a lot, crypto. Yeah, Bitcoin is a pretty energy dependent. Um, you know, on average, annual average, it uses the same amount of energy as probably like Argentina or maybe even a bigger country at this point. But, um, you know, Ethereum, you know, at the time before they merged to proof of stake, it was probably using on par with like the energy consumption of all of Australia. Um, but now with its move off of proof of work to proof of stake, you know, that energy usage has dropped significantly. Um, it's still a lot, but it's, you know, the technologies are getting better. Uh, there are different protocols being created, uh, different consensus protocols that are, addressing the energy usage. Um, it's, people are very, very aware of the energy consumption and the environmental impact in the uh, crypto space. Uh, we talk about it all the time. And you know, most of us who are in the space um, want that to improve and it is improving. Um, in fact, I would say it's improving a lot faster than most things. Like you know, if you look at the car industry, how long that's been around and how long it took them to start changing things around. You know. Uh, blockchain technology in the crypto space has, like I said, only been around a little bit over a decade. And we're already making leaps and bounds within a decade on how to address the environmental concerns. So, um, you know, take all of that with a grain of salt. You know, look at the entire bigger picture of what's going on. Um, you know, there are going to be detractors to the crypto space. Primarily, they use the environmental argument a lot. But there are a lot of balanced counter arguments to this. Um, the one thing, so I, I'm not one of those people who goes around crying fake news, fake news. Actually, I love journalism. I love the media to a certain degree, but they're also uh, a lot of modern media. They are using sound bites and not really understanding. They're not experts in any particular field and um, latching on to specific arguments just to generate controversy on, on subject matter, uh, to generate clicks and whatnot. So you know, do your research, look at arguments, look at counter arguments, um, you know, figure out where the balance is. Um, any issues that are cropping up in the space are being addressed, are being talked about. They're not being ignored. We do give a crap about the climate. And um, I don't, there's just, aren't any more questions in the chat, but uh, Z probably um, wanted to clear up something um, that he mentioned earlier. And he says, yes, FTX is an example. The one that crushed that crushed recently, who was owned by one guy from South Korea is another. 
Yeah, it looks like Luna a, was the name. Yeah, Z, That's yeah, our, our good friend Z. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so FTX did crash. Luna crashed as a currency. Uh, there's been other crashes, um, you know, in the past. Um, honestly, this is going to happen in any kind of percolating ecosystem. I mean, it's not like we don't see stocks crash and burn. Obviously, they work on different fundamentals, um, but, you know, nothing, this is what I tell people a lot, is like nothing is absolute in the world, um, you know, even with physical products, one moment they're here and the next moment they're obsolete because technologies change or, uh, you know, something happens at a market level or economic level that causes something to crash. Usually the things, the coins and currencies or exchanges that are crashing are because they're uh built on really, really bad fundamentals. So it's really important to understand what you're investing in or an exchange you're participating in. If there are a lot of like dark layers to it, my recommendation is to stay steer clear. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand whether or not there are dark layers there. Um, so there is a lot of uh, buyer beware right now uh, in terms of you know new tokens that are spun up, but I'm optimistic that as the blockchain protocols become more mature, they become more secure. And again, like I said, governments are starting to get into the uh, regulation space. And I, I'm not anti-regulation in the crypto space. In fact, I think there needs to be some kind of account another accountability layer there. That's just my own opinion. Um, there are going to people be people who argue against that with me. But um, I think in order to fundamentally have trust in this ecosystem, we needed we do need to participate in partnership with governments at some level. Um, so yeah, you know, just, just be careful in, in what you're investing in or participating in um, yeah, and just research, research, research. And um, Wendy actually asks, where would that research be done? Um, Freakonomics as an example. Uh, looks like somebody mentioned Freakonomics as a podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't, I haven't listened to that podcast, so I, I couldn't give you any opinion on that. Um, for me, I believe in balanced research. Research is like everything I do. I'm a product designer. So when I'm doing research, I have to look at a lot of different sources, not just one or two sources. I'm usually looking at like five to 10 sources of information just to make sure I'm looking at a balanced, um, you know, balanced informational landscape. Uh, you know, given, you know, the crypto space, there's a lot of good, great information out there online. There's also a lot of misinformation. Um, you know, exchanges generally give some good beginner uh, learning material on things. You should definitely go to, like, uh, take Cardano, for example. They have a site. You can go to Cardano and learn about it and learn what they're doing. Um, I would, if you know people who work in the crypto space, you know, um, they're probably good people to talk to, you know, people like myself also. I, I don't actually um, build blockchain technologies or anything like that, but I am creating my own NFT, so I do participate in the ecosystem. Um, and I've been participating for many years, so I'm very familiar with what's going on. Um, but like I said, there's so many tokens out there right now that even people who have been in the space for a very, very long time aren't going to be able to have a handle on every single token out there. So, um, you know, you're going to have to go to the source of every token, learn about the team, look at what they've done in the past, who's on their board <laughs> even, Um are they conducting themselves with full transparency at a uh, you know, organizational level? Those are all important things to consider. Um, if you really, really want to dig in, into organizations and tokens, there's ways to do it. Um, it's just, yeah, there's a lot of research to be done. I think um, we have another, we have a raised hand, Wendy. Um, I'll ask them to unmute. Hello. So, um, okay. So that sounds like you, um, you know, you have to research, uh, well, it's like, okay, you're immersed in this world. How would a beginner, you know, um, uh, uh, find sources of information, uh, that could be trusted, you know, I mean, other than Google and Wikipedia and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, how does somebody find information, you know, that 
can be research and trust. What authorities do you trust to, you know, considering that it's decentralized? Um, okay, this is actually a big philosophical question you're, ans you're asking, because this doesn't just apply to the crypto space. You know, it applies to all aspects of life at this point. You know, who who can you trust? But if we're talking about the uh, crypto crypto space itself, um, yeah, who who do I trust? Uh, so can I interject, um, Ev? Yeah. The library has a lot of books on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So if you're a beginner, you can learn about it that way, and those are trusted, authoritative sources. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, they're written by people who probably built the technologies themselves. So, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, like Leah mentioned, a lot of books out there. Um, I'll, I'll give you anecdotally speaking, I jumped into this. Uh, I think just being a technologist, I kind of have a fundamental understanding on how things work technologically. So I, what I did was I didn't just look at the currency or the token. You know, I wasn't really interested in the investment portion of it. I was really interested in the the technology portion of it and how it could benefit society. You know, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of questions, you know, in the chat today and in, in like my past talks, a lot of people kind of just narrowly focus on this investment part of it and whether or not I should, I should buy or sell or whatever. Back up from that question, back out of it, really think about is the technology going to benefit society or are there potentials there? What do I need to know about the technology fundamentally to feel a secure in my knowledge about getting into the investment side of it or getting into the participatory side of it. So, you know, I, I did read a lot on how blockchain works and there are a lot of technical papers out there. So I had to read up on, um, you know, how does the cryptographic layer work on the chain? How, you know, what is proof of work? What is proof of state? And I don't expect everybody here to get in there and read all these technical papers. So that's why I do these talks to give more of a lay, lay person's overview of how they work. But I, I created trust based on my technical understanding of what's going on. Um, but that's just me. I'm one person and that's how I approach things. I like to really understand the fundamental foundational layers of anything I get into. Um, and I think that's how, and from there, you're going to be able to spin off and find those books and find those trusted technologists who built those technologies, who are writing books, or those people who are founding uh, trustworthy companies who are writing about it in their blogs or papers they publish. Uh, for example, um, Buterin, the guy who created Ethereum, I actually I have a lot of trust in him as an entrepreneur. He also philosophically aligns with myself because you know, he cares about the environment and he talks about things uh, that are impacting the energy consumption all the time. It's just why he moved Ethereum into a proof of stake. Um, so as an authority figure, I trust him generally. He hasn't given me a reason not to trust anybody. So uh, if we're talking about the big philosophical layer, again, this is just my own personal opinion. You may or may not agree with me is that uh, I give trust until you give me a reason not to trust or unless I find something that is untrustworthy foundationally with something. Um, so, yeah, we just live in a weird world right now where there's a lot of misinformation flying around. And, you know, here, here I'll tell you this, to bring things out of the abstract, Wendy, if you ever run across something and you have questions whether or not it's a trustworthy source, feel free to email me, run it by me. I'll take a look at it. So, um, I guess the, the next question um, is a concern by Matt who asks, how about the use of cryptocurrency for ransom by criminal criminal terrorist organizations? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not a terrorist, so I don't think like them. Um, I, I mean, there is a lot of anonymity in, you know, in trading crypto and stuff like that. However, there's this kind of misconception that, you know, any that you can never find out who is creating transactions, you know, you know, on the blockchain. Here's the thing. If somebody wants to cash out their cryptocurrency, at some point they have to exchange it. Um, and that has to go through different financial government layers and regulations and red tape and, and bureaucratic layers. Um, now, it may be that I'm just speculating here from based on things I've heard is that 
you know, maybe I uh, ransomed a big chunk of crypto from somebody and then I distributed that big chunk amongst many, many different wallets, hundreds of thousands of wallets. And then those are gone through exchanges. So they look like little micro transactions that are then, you know, taken out of banks to create, you know, the big pool of money. So there's there's a lot of complexity to if I was to uh, be a bad actor on, on how to stay anonymous. But you're never truly 100% anonymous. Um, that's like a misconception. Uh, you know, like I said, because every transaction is recorded on the block on the block uh, blockchain, um, you can actually see where all these transactions came from and lead to. And eventually, they do touch exchanges at some point, unless somebody is literally just keeping their transactions in the crypto uh, ecosystem permanently. Um, yeah, there's always there. There's a reason why government uh law enforcement um uh, organizations are able to track down these people you know it's, it's not 100 percent anonymous okay next question we have is by Susie. which crypto is most trusted and stable by big corps that use crypto most trusted uh you, you know i well i trust cardano i trust um you know, the people behind the Ethereum protocols. But, you know, here's the thing, because it's decentralized at this point, so decentralized, um, I guess you'd have to talk about which exchanges you trust. That's the really thing I guess you should focus on. Um, and I guess there is, there's like certain trust things to be talked about, like in terms of whether or not a token will collapse. Um, I, I trust a lot of the tokens and currencies that have been around now for about 10 years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stability there. Uh, you know, something like Luna was still relatively new. Um, uh, but there are, yeah, uh, in terms of exchanges, I generally trust Coinbase. I generally trust Gemini. Um, Binance a little, is a little touch and go right now. You, know, you may want to be careful with that one because it's, um, it's actually banned in the U.S. You can't use Binance in the U.S. You have to use offshore, um, offshore means of using Binance. Um, FTX obviously had problems. Um, yeah, I guess I would need to know specifically what you're wanting to know about. Then I can tell you if I know anything about it. You know, I can, I, I know about Avalanche, I know about Polkadot, you know, but you know, there's a lot I don't know. The next question is from Anvita. An uh, what are some legit sources forums to learn and look at that transparent information? Uh, I think this is essentially the same question as what Wendy asked, right, in terms of like which trusted sources. Um, so yeah, I've already answered that question. Okay. Oh yeah, thanks for uh, sharing my email there, Leah. Um, yes, if anybody wants to reach out to me um, for any additional questions, I think we're a little bit over time here, uh, feel free. Um, also the slides, if you want copies of the slides, I can share a link or share the actual slides. I think Leah, you have the link for that. Um, yeah, I'll be sending the slides and the recording after the program. Okay. Yeah, and um, I saw somebody mention real quick that my presentation is much more objective. Um, I appreciate that. That's something I aim for. I'm not a talking head. I, The whole purpose of this is to arm you with as much information going forward and make your own objective um, decisions. Uh, on whether or not you should participate or not. So I, I actually appreciate that comment. And thank you all for being here. Yeah, and if there are no further questions, um, thank you again, Ev, for your great presentation, uh, getting some good comments in the chat, um, saying, you know, engaging talk, yeah, really you know, well-researched, you're super knowledgeable, and we really appreciate your spending time with us today. Um, so eloquent, eloquent speaker. Thank you for the great presentation. So again, um, thank you for uh, educating us on cryptocurrency, and um, we hope to see you again soon. All right, everybody. This was fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.